We are now live, doctors. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining uh, our Synaptic Club. As you know, this is our uh, monthly uh, session in different topics of neurology. So this is actually the 13th session of a Synaptic Club, which is an educational webinar, uh, trying to outline the updates in different topics of neurology. Uh, today's uh, session uh, will be about OCT as a diagnostic tool in neurology. Uh, all the sessions of Synaptic Clubs are uh, endorsed by uh, KNS and KIMS, and all the sessions are CME accredited. As you know, we will send you the attendance CME certificates a few days after the, uh, the session. If you have any issues, you can always email us at info at synapticclub.com. Uh, Today's session, as we indicated, it's uh, optical coherence tomography application in MS and neuro-ophthalmologic disorder. Our uh, uh, session is sponsored by Roche. Uh, as you know, you can always use the Q&A uh, function uh, to ask any questions and we will direct it to the uh, guest speaker. The next session will be on the 22nd of November about ALS, and we will send you the invitation very shortly. Our guest speaker today is Dr. Raad Bahabahani. Uh, he's a consultant ophthalmologist. He's a neuro-ophthalmologist, an oculoplastic and uh, orbital surgeon at Al Bahar Ophthalmology Center in Kuwait. Uh, he did his residency in ophthalmology at Dalhousie University, Halifax, Canada, uh, Dr. Bavahani also did a fellowship in neuro-ophthalmology and uh, ocul oculoplastic surgery fellowship at uh, Will's Eye Hospital in Philadelphia, USA. He has more than 70 publications in the field of ophthalmology and neurology. And without any further ado, please uh, welcome Dr. Raad. Thank you, Dr. Raad, for inviting me to give this talk. All right, can you all see my slides? Yes, we can. Okay, so I've, I've called this talk OCT and MS and beyond <laughs> because uh, I was asked to talk 45 minutes and I thought I focus on MS, uh, which is really the prime, uh, the prime uh, uh, it's, it's what you really uh, want from this talk. And I, I'm gonna discuss a few other things which may be of relevance and importance for you as a neurologist. So I have no financial disclosure from this doc. The eye is window to the soul. Wrong. The eye is window to the brain. So it wasn't actually long ago when uh, a neuro-ophthalmologist, Dr. Hoyt, he's one of the most uh, important neuro-ophthalmologists of the last century, um, that he's noticed uh, uh, slit-like defects in the retinal nerve fiber layer when he used an ophthalmoscope to look at the fundi of patients with multiple sclerosis. Those patients were visually asymptomatic. They did not have optic neuritis. They were mostly patients who had uh, other neurological events, namely spinal cord and brainstem. And what he noticed is these defects that you can see in the, in the arrow. So what is OCT? Is OCT is basically ultrasound of the eye that we use light instead of the eye. And what it does, it gives you reproducible cross-sectional images of the retina with very high resolution. And if you think about the resolution of OCT, you think about the commercially available devices right now, spectral domain OCT, the, the resolution, the actual resolution is about 10 to 15 microns. A three Tesla MRI resolution is one millimeter. So even a commercial OCT device is uh, about a hundred times higher in resolution than a three Tesla MRI. And what this does and what this uh, gives you as a neurologist is a unique opportunity to look at the eye and to look at the axons. And as you know, the retina has axons 
that there are no oligodendrocytes dendrocyte in the retina, so there's no myelin. So this, the only real place in the CNS really where you can actually look directly at axons. And what it does, it gives you a quantitative assessment of the retinal nerve fiber layer, the ganglion cell layer, and uh, the internuclear layer, which we all talked about recently. And this is just um, orient, um, reminder of the distribution of the retinal nerve fiber layer. So as you know, the, the, uh, the macular, the fibers coming from the temporal uh, side to the phobia go to the superior and inferior aspect of the optic nerve. And we have the papillomacular bundle, which is responsible for central vision. And this goes directly from the fovea to the optic nerve. And the nasal retinal fibers, they go to the nasal side of the optic disc. So think about that when you look at the OCT and when you look at some of the OCT printouts. So this is a, 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 a spectral domain OCT. And there's, uh, on the left side, you can see the representative retinal layers. And as you can see with the new segmentation algorithms now, we are able to segment all the retinal layers and study them in detail and measure them. However, for you neuro as neurologists, I think you're mo mostly interested with the optic nerve. And for, uh, for MS, most of the changes that occur in the retina occurs in the inner retinal layers. So these will be the nerve fiber layer, the ganglion cell layer, and the inner plexiform layer, and the inner nuclear layer. And you can see those on the OCT. So this is the nerve fiber layer. The ganglion cell layer and the inner plexiform layer has about the same amount of reflectivity. And by reflectivity, I mean the same degree of shadow. So they often uh, measured in combination. And we have the inner nuclear layer right there. And if you think for you as neurologists, what do you want from an MRI? You wanna assess two things. You wanna see change. You're looking for changes. And that is new lesions in MS. So new T2 uh, lesion, new gadolinium enhancing lesion. And you can see that in the OCT by changes in the inner nuclear layer. And you're also assessing neurodegeneration and you can assess transsynaptic degeneration by looking at the ganglion cell layer and the inner plexiform layer. And this is a typical uh, printout of an OCT uh, report for two devices. And these are, um, these are one of the most widely co uh, available commercial devices. So the Spectralis OCT and the Cirrus OCT. And you can see here, on the left side, you can see that there's the scan around the retinal nerve fiber layer. So a, circ a circular scan will give you a topographic map-like assessment of the thickness of the retinal nerve fiber layer. So this is given in quadrants. So it's nasal, temporal, superior, and inferior. And you can see that also there here in the, on the right side as well. And the nice addition OCT in recent year has been the ability to look at the ganglion cell layer. So here we're looking at the ganglion cells themselves, which forms uh, the, uh, the origin of the axons of the optic nerve. And when we do that, we segment the macula, the phobia, because the macula is rich in, in ganglion cell. And you can see here on the upper uh, diagram, you can see the areas in red, so the red it means basically increasing density for ganglion cell. And here you can see that it's kind of, there's no red, so there's loss of ganglion cell right here. And on the serious device, you can see here the green, normal ganglion cell layer. Lower down here, there's loss of ganglion cell layer. So you might think, how can OCT be useful in MS? Well, there are different reasons why you want to use OCT as a tool in multiple sclerosis. And these are some of the, uh, some of them. You want to do OCT, basically you want to rule out a subclinical optic neuropathy in, a, in an MS patient or patient you suspect having MS who's presenting with a neurological event and you want to assess if there's any uh, axonal loss in the optic nerve. You want to also uh, diagnose prior optic neuritis. So let's say a patient who is presenting with, uh, with a neurological event, and he may have a history or may not have a history, 
of a prior optic neuritis, you want to be able to see that in order to fulfill your criteria of dissemination in time and space. Uh, recently, with the emergence of uh, new optic nerve phenotypes such as NMO, you want to make that distinction between classic demyelinating optic neuritis and NMO because, as you know, the treatment is not the same, and you want to make that distinction quite early in order to uh, initiate the appropriate treatment. You can also use MS as a tool to predict those patients who are more likely to progress and get more disability in the future, and therefore you can adjust your treatment accordingly. And in addition, also you can assess uh, disease activity and you can monitor uh, the side effects of some of the drugs used for multiple sclerosis. So as you all know, uh, uh, axonal loss occurs in patients with optic with the MS, and whether they've had or they haven't had optic neuritis in the past, uh, if you do an OCT on those patients, you will see that they would have axonal loss. And this is about seven to eight, seven microns in patients with MS without history of optic neuritis. We also know from OCT studies that the rate of axonal loss is faster in MS patients than normal. And the rate of ganglion cell loss is also uh, is about twice normal rate normal. And even if, if you look at patient of, let's say CIS patient, patient who had not had optic neuritis in the past, you will see that they have lower thickness ganglion cell uh, layer on those patients. So this is a typical uh, OCT for a patient with acute optic neuritis. And you can see here on the Left side, there's some swelling of the optic nerve and you can see thickening. So the, the thickness of the nerve fiber layer is above normal, so there's thickening. And at this stage, uh, it's not really helpful because all what you see is thickening and swelling of the optic nerve. But what happens over time is that you lose uh, some of the accents, so you lose the thick, some of the thickness of the retinal nerve fiber layer, and this occurs in about 20 microns in MS patients. And there's always predilection for the temporal retinal nerve fiber, so the temporal back, uh, the macular papular bundle. And this is uh, from a paper that uh, by Fiona Costello. They looked at patients with optic neuritis, and they looked at both the ganglion cell loss and the retinal nerve fiber layer loss. And you can see that most of the loss occurs at about three months. So 90% of the uh, axonal loss and the ganglion cell loss in optic neuritis occurs up to the point of three months. And after that, there isn't much change. There's very small change indeed. This is an OCT from a patient a few months after an optic neuritis. And you can see here the temporal uh, aspect of the, uh, of the disc. There is temporal thinning and there is loss of the, the axon of the papillomacular bundle. And this occurs also on the other side. So if you look here on the other side, there's also thinning of the uh, macular papillary bundle. And you can see that this is with the new spectralis uh, program, you can measure actually the macular papillary bundle. So you can see it's reduced on both. What about ganglion cell? in uh, acute optic neuritis. So uh, because there is edema of the, uh, of, the, uh, of the axons initially, we said the retinal fiber layer is not really helpful to look or to predict uh, the course of this or the final visual outcome of this patient. So the ganglion cell layer has been a nice addition because it, it's not affected by edema of the retinal nerve fiber layer. So you can assess neurodegeneration quite early in patients with optic neuritis. You can see here on the left side, the areas in red, this is areas of ganglion cell loss. This is the printout of a patient three weeks post-optic neuritis. And as you can see here on the left side, the retinal nerve fiber looks normal. While on the right side, you can see already there is some ganglion cell loss has already been uh, initiated there on the uh, right side. So this is three weeks post-optic neuritis. And this is a picture from a paper that we published just showing you the lag between the ganglion cell layer and the retinal nerve 
fibril. So while the retina non fibril layer is normal in thickness, there is already loss of the ganglion ciliary, which occurs almost immediately at onset, and it then doesn't change much beyond the point of three months up to six months. Now, what about diagnosing prior optic neuritis? Uh, this, is, this was a paper that looked at patients who've, uh, that included about 11 centers, and they looked at patients with with MS, and they, they studied the difference between the uh, OCT, the RNFL OCT in both eyes, to diag as, as, uh, as a marker for prior optic neuritis. So it's not much as the absolute uh, value, because as you know, the values from the OCT are obtained from population, and these may be, they may be population, they may be Caucasian populations, so or the, the normative data may not be applicable to your population. So by looking at the difference between the two eyes, this actually may be a, a more robust marker for prior optic neuritis. And what they found is that if you have a difference in the retinal nerve fiber layer of a bit, about five microns between the two eyes or the ganglion cell layer of four microns between the two eyes, this is a very robust marker for prior optic neuritis. Uh, this patient, this paper was published in neurology and what they essentially found similar findings. They found that nine micron difference in the retina non fiber layer between the two eyes has about 73% uh, sensitivity for prior optic neuritis. And the ganglion cell layer was even more sensitive. So a difference of six microns or more is almost 96% uh, sensitive for prior optic neuritis, as opposed to using the normative data. So they, the normative data in comparison did really poorly, only 37% for RNFL and 76% for the ganglion cell layer. And I think this is important for you as neurologists because I think, uh, as you know, the, the uh, diagnostic criteria for MS is heavily geared toward using MRI. And uh, sometimes MRI doesn't really help you doesn't uh, detect prior optic nerve lesions. So you, uh, there's been a debate as whether you should OCT as uh, to be included as one of the diagnostic criteria for uh, um, an MS. And basically a lesion found in OCT would be considered lesion that, uh, that would be included in the, your diagnostic criteria. And therefore that would probably improve your sensitivity of the current, currently used diagnostic criteria. It's an ongoing debate the opposing view is that really probably doing OCT or VEP or all the other tests does not really improve your, uh, the uh, current sensitivity of these criteria. So this is a question that is open for uh, debate. Now, what about differentiating uh, NMO from MS? And you can probably diagnose NMO based on some uh, certain clinical features. So we know as NMO, gives you a more rapid, more profound loss of vision, uh, mild disc edema or normal. You can do LP and you can do CSF uh, would help you. And uh, if you don't find oligoclonal band, then this is probably not MS and it's probably NMO. In addition, by imaging, you can probably, there are probably things that tip you towards the diagnosis of NMO. So as you know, NMO will give you more posterior lesions more extensive lesions of the optic nerve and the chiasm, which is extremely rare in multiple sclerosis. However, in recent years, we've come to know uh, OCT can really be helpful in diagnosing NMO. So the main difference is that the, uh, the, nerve, uh, the nerve fiber layer thickness is more significantly worse in NMO than multiple sclerosis. And there are some studies that found, if you uh, that found that if you lose about 41 microns of RNFL, then this is almost 100% specific for NMO. MS just doesn't do that. In addition, the nerve fiber layer loss tends to be more diffuse in NMO, while NMS, as we said, it, it's more temporal, right? It's a papillomacular bundle. And even when they looked at the difference between the two eyes, they found that, that there's more difference in NMO. So the RNFL difference between the two eyes was 30 uh, compared to about nine in, uh, in patient with MS. And this is a diagram from a paper. And uh, on the left side, you will see uh, multiple sclerosis optic neuritis and NMO optic neuritis. And like, uh, like we said, 
the MS optic nerves will be more temporal, while NMO is more diffuse, and there is even more loss of ganglion cell layer in NMO than in multiple sclerosis. And I think this is also important in terms of uh, understanding the, uh, uh, the pathophysiology of the disease, because uh, with MS, you get demyelination, you get DG, uh, kind of mild degeneration. NMO is more like um, directed toward astrocytes. So the mechanism, the pathophysiology of the disease is different. You get necrosis and you get more profound uh, neuronal and axonal loss with NMO than in multiple sclerosis. So OCT might be helpful in terms of like understanding the pathophysiology of the disease as well. Uh, there have been some studies that they, what they did is they looked at the foveal thickness. So they measured the thickness of the fovea in patients NMO and uh, in patients with NMO who have not had, had history of optic neuritis and they compared that to control. And the reasons that they looked at the fovea because the fovea is rich in Mueller cell, which has a corporeal four channel. And what they found is that the foveal thickness was reduced in NMO, in NMO patient, even if they did not have history of optic neuritis. And again, this goes back to the idea of that NMO is an astrocytopathy uh, uh, with, with a parent neuroaxonal, with, uh, without a parent neuroaxonal damage. And, and this is one a paper that was published a few years back. So what they did, they looked at the foveal thickness, and then they looked at the uh, healthy controls patients with longitudinal, uh, with LATM and optic neuritis patient. And you can see here that the foveal thickness is reduced in LATM patients, uh, similarly to patients with, with optic neuritis. So that means that the foveal thickness reduced is, is independent of optic neuritis. And again, that goes back to the pathophysiology because the fovea has uh, Miller cells, which, which has aquaporin four channels. So there might be some subclinical kind of damage in an NMO patient independent of optic neuritis, which occurs in the retina. And uh, the other thing is that they, they, the phobia shape would, uh, would be different as a result of that. So the normal phobia has a V-shaped configuration, as you can see here on the upper diagram with, with, with loss of phobia thickness in an NMO, it, it takes a more of a U-shaped configuration. Now, what about OCT as a prognostic tool for predicting a worsening in disability. And this was a paper that was published year back. And what they found is that that patient who initially have a retinal neurofibrillator thickness of about 87, regardless of the machine that they've used, have about double the risk of disability worsening up to three years. And this risk was increased to about four times uh, up to the fifth year. This was another paper in which they looked at the uh, retina nerve fiber layer as measured by OCT as a prognostic tool, not only for physical disability, but also as for cognitive disability. And they basically came up with the same, frame, same findings that patients with low RNFL thickness, um, this was independently associated with about three fold increase in EDSS progression and 2.7 fold risk of, in cognitive decline. So, this is relevant, I think, to you as neurologists because you diagnose patients with MS and you, if you see those patients have very low retinal nerve fiber layer thickness or very low ganglion cell thickness, you might want to consider being more aggressive in terms of treating those patients because, as you know, they are more likely to progress in the coming years. This was another study in which look, they looked at CIS patients and looking at the ganglion cell layer. So what they found is that patients who had highest number of uh, ganglion cell were less likely to, uh, to be diagnosed event eventually according to the abdominal criteria. So you can see here patients with the uh, highest uh, ganglion cell layer had the, the lowest rate of conversion. And they also, whereas patients with the lowest ganglion cell layer had the high risk of conversion to, uh, to clinically definite multiple sclerosis. And they also looked at uh, patients meeting the NADA criteria, so this activity of disease. And they found the same finding. Patients with higher thickness ganglion cell layer 
are more likely to meet the NADA3 criteria, whereas patients with the lowest ganglion cell layer uh, tended to have more active uh, disease. So what about disease activity? You're using OCT to, uh, to assess disease activity. I'm gonna talk about the internuclear layer here. So the internuclear layer is one of the layers in the retina and it contains the bipolar, the amacrine cell, the neural cell, which send axons to the ganglion cell layer. And uh, numerous papers that, that found that the thickness of the internuclear layer might be an indication of the activity of disease. So in this study, the internuclear volume was correlated with uh, new optic neuritis, MS optic neuritis, and also clinical relapse and new T2 lesions. So uh, in essence, internuclear may be a useful marker for detecting inflammatory disease activity. And this is a, a, a diagram, a graph from that paper. So looking at the annualized new gadolinium enhanced lesion, you will see positive correlation between this and the internuclear layer volume. The same thing goes with new T2 lesions. There's a positive correlation with the internuclear uh, layer volume. Uh, this was another paper that looked at patients who uh, were either uh, started on a primary DMT or were switched to a secondary TMT. And what they found is that patients who've, uh, who've had uh, no activity uh, who've, who did not meet the, uh, the NADA th uh, three criteria, basically continued to have active disease, had higher thickness, higher uh, thickness in the internuclear layer than patients who eventually did uh, meet the NADA three criteria. So patients who uh, disease was, uh, uh, became inactive, the internuclear layer redu was reduced in thickness, which indicates the same thing, that the internuclear layer correlates with disease activity. Now, the issue about this microcystic macular edema. So uh, this was reported in 2012, and uh, it was found uh, in a subset of patients with multiple sclerosis. And uh, what they found is that it's basically the same thing as the, uh, the, what we've said about the internuclear layer. It predicted the development of new lesions, new T2 lesions, and progression, and also relapse. Uh, this was uh, found in patients with prior optic neuritis, but it's not specific for uh, MS optic neuritis. It's been reported also in other types of optic neuropathy, such as labor, glaucoma, dominant optic atrophy, and toxic nutritional optic neuropathy. And you should not confuse this with the, the edema that we're going to talk about uh, when we speak about, when we talk about fingolimod. So, this is a microcystic macular edema that is def well-defined, well-localized to the internuclear layer. What, is, what does that mean to you as neurologists? Well, it basically means the same thing as we, uh, what we said about uh, uh, internuclear thickening. It probably suggests a more aggressive disease. It probably tells you that you need to be more aggressive in terms of uh, initiate this patient on DMT or maybe switch them to a more efficacious treatment. And it probably suggests that there is an early onset to the optic nerve and more workup uh, is needed in a patient in whom you suspect having multiple sclerosis. And the last thing about OCT and MS is the, uh, the issue of the fingolimod associated macular edema. As you know, you can use OCT to diagnose uh, fingolimod associated macular edema. I have to say it's very rare. I haven't seen it in a patient yet. Uh, the mechanism is thought to be, a, 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 as you know, in this fingolimod is fingosine one uh, in, uh, uh, inhibitor. So uh, this is this mechanism, this inhibition is thought so, to somehow increase the vascular permeability and break down the blood retinal barrier and you get uh, edema. So the edema here is, is not localized to the inner clear, it's basically tra traverses the whole retina. Uh, this is a dose dependent uh, a side effect. It resolves when you stop the treatment. Uh, baseline and follow-up examination is recommended. And uh, 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 basically, I've noticed that neurologists do yearly OCT 
for patients who are uh, fingaloma. I don't think this is necessary as long as the patient is aware of his vision. Sometimes you give patients uh, Amsler blurred, or you, you tell the patient if you see a straight line and if you see a wave, some kind of waviness or break in a straight line, then you should probably uh, uh, come to see an ophthalmologist. It is rare, and I haven't seen it, uh, at least in the group uh, the, uh, in which I was involved with Dr. Raad al-Rogani. Now, I'm gonna talk a bit about OCT and papilledema. So uh, I was trying to think of things that uh, neurologists would, uh, would, would find some diagnostic difficulty, and papilledema is probably one of them. And you can, you can uh, use OCT in papilledema. You can use it essentially to follow up uh, patients with IIH. But, uh, but the RNFL by itself is not really good for differentiating papilledema from pseudopapilledema. And the reason for that could be, for pseudopapilledema, could be myelated nerve fiber layer, could be drusen, could be anomalous disc. Uh, the simple reason being that uh, even anomalous disc or pseudopapilledema can give you thickening in the retinal nerve fiber layer. And the improvement of the retinal nerve fiber layer thickness does not necessarily mean that there is improvement in vision. It could be just optic atrophy starting and external loss. And this is just a graph to uh, uh, basically illustrate what I was saying. So this is a patient with a crowded disc. And this is a patient with a tilted disc. And this is a patient with drusen, right? And um, they all have, can have thickening, some thickening of the retinal nerve fiber layer, as you can see here in the white, right? So this does not really help you in differentiating the, uh, those conditions from early papilledema. When it's quite obvious papilledema, as, as here, stage four papilledema, you don't need an OCT to diagnose that. So this is an OCT in a patient with IIH, and you can see uh, uh, there is thickening of the retinal nerve fiber layer in both sides. And you can look at the thickness here, the average thickness, right? So because the retinal nerve fiber layer is not really helpful in diagnosing papilledema, people started looking at more of a, a qualitative measure. So what they, one of the things what, uh, was that they looked at the uh, RPE and Brooks membrane peripapillary RPE and retinal pigment epithelium and Brooks membrane. And what happens with papilledema is that there is increase in the intracranial pressure as opposed to the vitreous pressure in the eye. So what happens is that this uh, RPE and Brooks membrane undergoes a kind of angulation towards the vitreous, a positive angulation. And people looked at that in OCT and they found that this is what happens with this is what happens with papilledema. You get this positive angulation of the uh, RPE and Brooks membrane towards the vitreous, and as the intracranial pressure normalizes, it goes back to normal to the negative kind of angulation configuration initially. So this is, might be actually more helpful in uh, diagnosing early papilledema than uh, using the retinal nerve fiber layer thickness. And one of the useful things in papilledema, because the retinal nerve fiber layer is thick initially, you can look at the ganglion cell layer and you can detect early ganglion cell loss. Um, so in a patient with IIH who has already a significant ganglion cell loss, you might wanna be more aggressive uh, in treating this patient, right? And you can see here the red areas uh, represent areas of ganglion cell loss. You can see here that the thickness of the retinal fiber is actually still high, but there's always there's already loss of the retinal uh, the retinal ganglion cell, and you can see that even in the uh, the uh, sector map here. Optic nerve root drusen. So this is one thing that is often confused with papilledema and uh, many patients would have unnecessary lumbar punctures because of that. So uh, optic nerve drusen are more common, um, is, occurs in about 2% of the population and if they're superficial, you can see them, but if they're buried under the uh, 
uh, under the disc. It's, it's difficult sometimes to do, diagnose them from papilledema. And although you can use uh, some tools such as B-scan, ultrasound, which can detect only calcified uh, drusen, fluorescein angi angiography sometimes uh, can help, uh, CT scan, and uh, of course you can do lumbar puncture to measure the intracranial pressure. But OCT, in recent years, the uh, Optic Disc Drusen Studies Consortium have developed certain criteria and recommendation for diagnosis optic disc drusen. So you can actually, uh, using enhanced depth imaging OCT, which is an OCT that just has lower penetration. So it can go down up to the uh, choroid. And you can see here that drusen looked are hyperreflective. So by hyperreflective, it means we mean black, right? So they have throw a black shadow. And they have a hyperreflective margin. You can see that here. So this is an error. This is one optic drusen, and it'd be impossible to see that using a ophthalmoscopy, right? Because it's buried. Now, one thing that can imitate the disc drusen is the blood vessel. However, you can tell them apart because, uh, by um, the kind of figure of eight configuration. You can see that it has a figure of eight configuration. So this is a blood vessel. And sometimes this can be confused as drusen, but you, you should be able to make that distinction. Now, what's the issue with uh, the other thing is that when they, they were doing OCT and they found these mass, uh, ovoid mass-like stru like structures, foams, these are not drusen. These are, um, uh, you can see them here. These are not specific uh, for drusen. They just indicate axoplasmic stasis so that you can see them in any condition where you have disc edema, such as papilledema, for example. And although some people have suggested that they might be a precursor or a variant of drusen. What about OCT in compressive optic neuropathy? So uh, this is one area where OCT may be useful. If the patient has a compressive optic neuropathy and let's say that this patient wants to undergo surgery by a neurosurgeon and you wanna predict the visual outcome of the uh, preoperative retinal nerve fiber layer or thickness or the ganglion cell layer is intact. This is associated with a better visual outcome. Uh, the other thing about uh, OCT and compressive optic neuropathy is that it can actually localize where the problem is. So uh, you can see binasal thin thin uh, thinning, for example, in chiasmal lesions, and you can see even homonymous type of thinning in retrochiasmal lesions. So this is a patient with uh, a typical chiasmal syn syndrome by temporal hemianopsia, and you can see the corresponding binasal, almost binasal here, it crosses the midline here on the right side, uh, loss of the ganglion cell layer. So here OCT is, is localizing. And this is uh, uh, from a paper, this is a, a patient with pituitary adenoma, and you can see here that the visual field is normal. Whereas if you look at the OCT, the retinal fiber layer looks sort of normal, but the, there's loss of the ganglion cell layer. So OCT is, uh, it has much more higher sensitivity for detecting uh, axonal loss and neuronal loss in, uh, in those patients. And although this patient may pass, you may pass the, the visual field as normal, uh, given that he has uh, loss of the ganglion cell, you wanna be more aggressive in treating this patient and you probably recommend surgery for this patient. What about retrochiasmal lesion? This is a patient with the a porencephalic cyst on the left side. And you can see here that on the left supranasal aspect, there is a bilateral supranasal homonymous type of ganglion cell layer thickening. So this is a one way to show transsynaptic degeneration, which occurs usually months, in retro, months after a retrochiasmal lesion. And here OCT is localizing, right? And you can see here that the visual field is normal, whereas the OCT shows a clear abnormality. This is a patient with a stroke to the left side, left occipital. 
area. And you can see here that there is a homonymous, uh, a left kind of homonymous uh, loss of the ganglion cell layer. So again, OCT here is localizing, and this is uh, corresponds with the right homonymous hemianopsia with you on the visual field. So I think I'm in time. So what I try to do is give you a kind of an overview of how OCT can be helpful for you, particularly in multiple sclerosis in terms of making decisions about treatment, in terms of diagnosing uh, prior optic neuritis, in terms of modifying your treatment. Um, uh, you can, uh, I've also tried to cover some aspect of uh, papilledema and how can you use OCT to diagnose drusen and make that distinction between papilledema and pseudopapilledema. And also that uh, the last bit was how OCT can be helpful to predict the visual outcome in patient with uh, compressive optic neuropathy. So this is my talk and I'm open for any questions. Uh, thank you, Dr. Farad, for this excellent uh, presentation. You've covered uh, lots of aspects of uh, neurology, uh, mainly MS and other uh, disorders. Uh, I encourage all the attendees to uh, submit their question in the Q&A section. We have a question for you, Dr. Raad, from Dr. Zuhair. Um, is there any role of OCT in diagnosing different metabolic storage disorder like uh, Tay-Sachs uh, disease? Um, not to my knowledge, I don't think so. Okay. Now, another question, can OCT be used to predict development of a paradoxical reaction in TBM? Uh, TBM is? Optochiasmatic arachnoditis. Um, I'm not sure what the, what the question means, actually. I, I... I tubercul I mean, tuberculous meningitis. Oh, tuberculous meningitis. Well, yeah. so paradoxical reaction would be what? Yeah, I don't know. I cannot understand. It's I mean, maybe Dr. Uh, Rajarshi can elaborate on the paradoxical reaction. Now, another question, Dr. Rad. Now, nowadays, rarely we use uh, VEPs. Uh, it used to be one of the uh, element of poser diagnostic criteria, but that was removed uh, for the last 10 years. Now, do you think OCT will be also as helpful as OCT in the diagnostic phase of MS? Well, I mean, a VEP is a, is a functional uh, tool, right? So we basically are looking at function. OCT, you're looking at structure, right? Uh, uh, VEP does not really localize where the problem is. So it tells you that the, the problem can be anywhere from the retina and the brain. OCT, uh, in addition to its higher reproducibility and resolution, it, it's localizing and you're basically looking at structure, right? And this is what you want in multiple sclerosis because neurologists, you're, you are more interested in location and localization, right? And this is what I was alluding to initially, it's that the ongoing debate about whether OCT should probably be added, uh, should OCT evidence of prior optic neuritis uh, would be, uh, should be added to the current diagnostic criteria for multiple sclerosis. The current di diagnostic criteria are heavily geared toward multiple, towards imaging. And MRI is not really very sensitive uh, sometimes in detecting prior optic nerve lesion. So um, only time would tell really uh, uh, the, the studies, the results, especially the look uh, by comparing the inter-eye RNFL difference and the inter-eye ganglion cell difference uh, are very robust in terms of showing prior uh, evidence of optic neuritis. So maybe that's something that um, should be considered in the future. Maybe you can add uh, OCT to your current diagnostic criteria. Okay. Now, if a patient has retinal disorder and then you suspect MS, will OCT help? 
Well, they already have certainly it will help them. because then you look in. Yeah. yeah. So you. So you. Is that. So is the question. Is it. Is it for diagnostic or. So you. you I understand what I was. Uh, you mean diagnostic purposes, right? Yes. Yeah. So yeah. So you can look at the. Uh, so there are a variety of retinal disorders that, for example, can mimic optic neuritis. And you can look at the uh, retina, la uh, retina layers here, and you would probably would look at the outer retina layers here in, in OCT to make that uh, distinction and diagnosis. So one of those conditions, for example, are MUTES or, Mo or Azor. And these are one of the kind of retinal inflammatory disorders that can mimic multiple sclerosis. So you can use OCT here to make that distinction and you can use, also use other functional tools such as ERG or multifold call ERG to make that uh, distinction. Okay, back to the question of the uh, tuberculous meningitis. Uh, the doctor says uh, the... Oh, so he's talking about, maybe he's talking about ethambutol? Yeah, probably the reversibility uh, of blindness with the use of antitubercular treatment. This is what... Yeah, uh, yeah. there have been many studies about that, and it's essentially the same thing, is that it, with, with toxic uh, nutritional, uh, toxic optic neuropathies, you have loss of the maculopapular bundle, right? So when you're doing an OCT, you're looking at the maculopapular bundle, and uh, this... So you can use the OCT here to, uh, to, to, to kind of predict, to assess how much neuronal cell loss or axonal loss that occurred. And you can also use, use it to predict the, the, the visual outcome, let's say the visual potential once you stop the treatment. So here OCT would help you for sure. All right. A question from Dr. Samar. Uh, if you have a seronegative NMO patient, uh, can you confirm NMO basically by OCT? Well, I mean, you cannot confirm it. You, you, you can have uh, features in the OCT and clinical features that would probably make you make that diagnos diagnosis. Uh, whether it's going to affect treatment or not, probably not, because you probably want to be more aggressive with this patient, whether uh, you have the NMO antibody negative or positive. So you cannot confirm the diagnosis, but certainly the, the features that we've mentioned, so diffuse loss of the retinal fiber layer the, uh, and the ganglion cell layer and uh, would suggest an NMO disorder rather than typical classic multiple sclerosis optic neuritis. Mm -hmm. Question from Dr. Ahmed uh, Hassan. A patient came with optic neuritis and MRI shows non-specific white matter lesions. And then you found uh, deficits in the retinal nerve fiber thickness. Uh, how, I, how would I know whether this thickness is specific for MS or not for another disorder? I don't know. Well, it, I mean, it would, not, it would not be specific for MS. It would be, it just tells you that there's been a prior insult to the optic nerve. So we have to kind of, correlate that with the, with the whole clinical picture and, and make the diagnosis based on that. But if you find a lesion in the optic nerve uh, or thinning of the retinal nerve fiber layer in the, opt in the optic nerve with OCT, then that would probably strengthen your uh, suspicion of uh, optic neuritis and might push you to do additional tests. Mm -hmm. Does previous optic neuritis prevent or hinder the ability of OCT to assess the activity and progression of MS? Yes, absolutely. So uh, you have to take that in consideration. And uh, generally in studies, uh, we tend to we classify uh, patients if they have optic neuritis or, or did not have optic neuritis. The other thing about OCT is the uh, so-called the floor effect. So you can only lose as much uh, retina nerve fiber layer beyond which you don't lose much retinal fiber so that you reach kind of a, a ceiling or a floor effect. So yeah, if you have a, a, a loss of retinal nerve fiber layer or uh, axons from prior optic neuritis, then that would definitely uh, limit uh, the value of OCT in this patient. Now, can VEP showing abnormalities earlier than OCT? 
Um, I don't, I'm, I don't think, I mean, there's no like head to head studies. Both are good in terms of showing the, uh, um, showing you an abnormality, but again, we're, we compar you're comparing structure with function, right? So you're not measuring the same thing. OCT is very sensitive. And as you can see, we, I can, as you can see, uh, we've shown and with, the, with the ganglion cell layer uh, analysis, you can detect lesion as early as two to three weeks uh, following optic neuritis. So, uh, I mean, can you see, can you detect abnormalities with VEP following two weeks? I don't, I don't really know the, the answer to that. But OCT is quite sensitive, especially if you have ganglion cell layer, it's quite sensitive to optic neuritis. Mm -hmm. Now, is the find are the findings of uh, OCT in MOG similar to NMO? Uh, no, actually, in, with MOG, it's more similar to uh, multiple sclerosis. There hasn't been many studies about uh, OCT in MOG, but it it kind of gives you a similar uh, kind of pattern to multiple sclerosis. So you don't get as much loss of axons. You don't get um, as much loss of uh, a ganglion cell, it's basically comparable to multiple sclerosis. Okay. Are there any peculiar application of OCT in pediatrics patient with NMO different than adults? Well, I mean, the problem with the pediatric is the, uh, is that, I mean, uh, there is no normative data for uh, many of the pediatric uh, population. I'm not sure, I'm not aware of many uh, OCT studies that were done for pediatrics and NMO. And um, I'm, I'm not really sure. I'm not sure I have to look up the, uh, I have to look and see if there has been uh, studies that were done specifically on pediatric patient with NMO. Now you can use uh, OCT, for example, in other disorders in pediatrics patients, with, for example, have optic uh, pathway gliomas uh, with near fibromatosis. And you can use OCT to kind of assess the, uh, uh, their optic nerves and follow them up. I'm not aware of uh, studies that were done uh, using OCT in pediatrics. All right. Last question. Uh, are OCT lesions irreversible in NMOSD? Well, I mean, yes. I mean, uh, once you have axonal loss, then this is, this is irreversible. You don't get, and it's the same with multiple sclerosis. So uh, it's just that it takes time to develop. And it, uh, as we've shown in the picture, most of the damage occurs in the three, six, up to 12 months. Beyond that, you don't get much uh, change. But yes, with, with NMO, the, uh, 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 the, the, the change is much more profound and uh, you can base your clinical decisions about what uh, to treat this, to be more aggressive probably when treating this patient. Let's say a patient develops optic neuritis and they lose about 40 or 50 microns. Uh, this means that the threshold for another uh, attack uh, uh, for uh, permanent visual damage is very, very low. And you wanna be careful with these patients. You wanna probably more be more aggressive uh, in treating those patients. Good. Well, I think we, let's see if there's, we have, so yeah. So I think we are very grateful, Dr. Rod, for your uh, time, for your efforts in answering all the questions for the great talk. Thank you very much uh, for having you. And uh, also thank you for all the attendees who uh, spared the night for the sessions. And uh, hopefully we'll see you very soon. Our next uh, session will be on the 22nd of November. It's about updates in ALS. Thank you, Dr. Raad. Thank you. Bye. Good night. Bye.